This is why Superman works alone. These videos are not for children. If you're a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. And in the past on this channel, I've talked to you about my disliking for the first Batman movie, my love for its follow-up, Batman Returns, and my nostalgia for its threequel, Batman Forever. Links in the bio. But now here today, I'm going to talk to you about the day Batman died. This is how it happened. This is how the Batman died. The answer that shocks probably absolutely nobody. The day Batman died is the day they released Batman and Robin. If you're a fan of this channel, it should come as no shock to you, as I've already had a bad movie night on here watching it with some friends. And if you're a fan of Batman, it should come as no shock to you, because... Well, it's probably your opinion, too. Now, some of you who are already familiar with my The Day It Died series may be thinking to yourself, Wait a second, V, this video's different. And admittedly, yeah, maybe it is. But if the bat boot fits... Say that again. If the boot fits. You see, there's no title that fits better than The Day Batman Died for a video like this. Because this movie is quite literally the thing that successfully killed the Burton Schumacher Batman franchise. And not only did it accomplish that, but it almost killed Batman. Like, altogether. So many planned sequels and reboots were scrapped over the years. Because they believed that Batman was no longer bankable. Because of this movie. Batman had become a remnant of a better left forgotten era. It took all of eight years for another Batman movie to be made. In today's rapid reboots and the rise of superhero significance in pop culture, that is unthinkable. We go from one franchise to another. The, the second somebody steps down for a role, there's already a line for somebody to step back in. We went from Tobey Maguire to Andrew Garfield to Tom Holland right quick. There was like no recovery time. But for nearly a decade, Batman fans went without another outing. All because of the bat bomb that is Batman and Robin. So now that the mystery is up and out of the way, and we know the when, let's talk about the why. We all know by now that Batman shouldn't, and quite frankly, shan't, murder. If only the people who put this movie together knew that, before they blatantly assassinated a whole heap of Batman characters on screen. Both Batman and Bruce Wayne have no discernible or describable personality. George Clooney made the very bold choice of taking the studio's money and doing next to no work in return. He was essentially paid for attendance. But to be fair, if we're talking about trying to follow this quadrilogy in general, going from Michael Keaton to Val Kilmer to George Clooney is enough to give anyone's brain whiplash. Now you can say what you want about replacing Keaton with Val Kilmer, but at least Val Kilmer tried. You understood the duality of the character, the man and the Batman. There was some sense of depth. Even if it wasn't always spoken, it was usually shown. George Clooney was, was just there. He was definitely in this movie, that, that much I can say, but that's literally the beginning and end of it. And that's really all I can say about his time in the role. This man went from tortured to torturous to watch. There's a reason this guy is the most hated Batman in the history of Batman. He was never really Batman, he was just some dude in a Batman costume. For two hours. He fails in every aspect of the character. What he says almost always seems disingenuous. There's nothing heartfelt coming out of his mouth. Nothing feels natural. Alfred's sick. Alfred's not sick. He's dying. I can't believe it. I know. I don't care if you gave him Keaton's black turtleneck and glasses. This is not my Batman. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna go ahead and say this is nobody's Batman. The best thing to come out of George Clooney's time in the role was George Clooney's sense of humor about George Clooney's time in the role. Join me, if you will, a brief journey through the years, looking back at George Clooney reflecting on his time as Batman. Feel free to timestamp the stages of grief. Remember when George Clooney was Batman? What if I don't want to remember? Well, I did one film, uh, Batman and Robin, which was a... Yes. Well, no, no. Oh, thank you. This is a disaster. <laughs> so you really couldn't say no to being the new Batman, could you? Quite honestly, when I got Batman and Robin, I was just an actor getting an acting job. So I ask... He won't let me watch it. No. He won't let you watch it. There's certain films I just go, I, I'm afraid, I, gotta, uh, my, I want my wife to have some respect for me. The fact is, um, 
uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm still, the jury's still out on whether or not I'm going to make it in feature films or not. And I was excited to play Batman, you know. It's Batman, you know. Bottom line mm -hmm. is, I get to be Batman. This is an opportunity for me to be in a film that may, may not, but may end up being very successful. And if it is, then I get to be part of that. And what I realized after that was that I was going to be held responsible for the movie itself, not just for my performance. <laughs> Did you see him hilarious. in that film? <laughs> It would just be shots of me in a rubber suit and a Batman <laughs> outfit. But, you know, I thought at the time this was going to be a very good career move. Um, it wasn't. S since I, uh, my Batman, I was disinvited from Comic-Con for 20 years. <laughs> I wasn't a very good Batman. I was, I'm the first one to say it. I screwed it up so badly I'm not allowed to weigh in on any of those subject matters anymore. I actually thought I destroyed the franchise until they brought it back. You know, they, somebody else brought it back years <laughs> later and changed it. So does that mean The Flash hasn't asked you to be in? Well, you know, the, the, the truth is I, I had no, I didn't want to do it. No, they didn't ask me. You don't want to see the George Clooney version of Batman and Robin? I had to get uh, a sandpaper and take down my nipples, you know. But then other than that, I think I'd be ready for it. Because didn't you apologize to the crowd at Comic-Con for Batman and Robin? I always apologize for Batman. <laughs> you know, when you destroy a franchise the way I did, usually they kind of, they don't, they look the other way when the Flash comes by. I met uh, Adam West back there just now, and I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. And he goes, give me a fist bump. And I was like, yeah, just hit me, just hit me. There. <laughs> I did have great nipples. And Robin didn't fare too much better either. I know not everybody loves Chris O'Donnell's time as Robin in Batman Forever, and I will continue to defend that guy until I'm blue in the face. Like this guy. But in this movie, there's absolutely no defending him. The last movie seemed to want to age up the character, to have him be a young man as opposed to a growing boy. He's depicted as being in his later teens and maybe being a little bit more mature than the Robins that we're used to. So does someone want to explain to me why in this movie, that's supposed to take place a few years after the last one, they have him acting more like a child? Here, Robin is prone to throwing hissy fits whenever he doesn't get his way. Don't push me right now. Or what? No one can capture Ivy but the big bad bat? Yeah, right. You just can't stand that maybe she wanted me instead of you. You just couldn't stand that she was going to kiss me and not you. Couldn't stand that something was going to be mine and not yours, could you? That's why you stopped us from kissing, because if you can't have her, no one can. I was right. I don't need your help. Look, here's what I know. She loves me and not you, and it's driving you crazy. It's your house, it's your rules. I mean, it's your way or the highway. It's Batman and Robin, not Robin and Batman. And I'm sick of it. Look, at, I want a Robin signal in the sky, all right? I'm tired of living in your shadow. Here, he lashes out at everyone, especially Batman. It's usually because he feels like he's being treated as a sidekick. But, um, hey, newsflash, Boy Wonder, you are a sidekick. I don't care that they prematurely gave you your Nightwing outfit for this. You are Robin, Batman's sidekick. This behavior isn't fitting of any of the children that had worn the cape in the comics. So it's definitely not ideal for the grown-ass man wearing it here. They took all the problems with O'Donnell's previous depiction of the character, and they exasperated them. Whilst completely forgetting any trait that made the character likable, and now that I said it out loud, I really think this performance alone is pretty symbolic of this entire movie. Commissioner Gordon is once again in this movie, and once again, he does absolutely nothing. I am the commissioner of the police. I have the keys right here in my pocket. The thing is, at least in the last films, he had some sense of dignity. The character did seem to be invested in his job, and he was depicted as being very good at it. As he should be, because he's the commissioner. He wasn't seen a whole lot, but when he was, it was always implied that he was working on taking down crime on his end of things. He and Batman were working on the same page. Just separately in different paragraphs. But here, for some reason, they decided to turn him into Chief O'Hara. The goofy, laughable, ineffective cop who would be helpless without Batman. The law enforcement that only enforced just how useless he truly was. It's just a very sad and, and, for lack of a better word, wrong interpretation of the finest of Gotham's finest. Jim Gordon is a man so attached to his work that he's practically married to it. He has a commitment to cleaning up crime. It's not just a job for him, it, it's a lifestyle. But here, the guy is... Just a buffoon. A, a really, really sad, pathetic buffoon. Let's see some Jim Deserve Better in the comments, guys. But the biggest travesty here 
isn't the depiction of the characters' past movies already established, it's the depiction of the ones that they just introduced. What was done to Mr. Freeze is completely unforgivable. Going into this, it was decided to use his origin story from the animated series. A heartbreaking tale of a scientist who froze his wife to keep her alive while desperately searching for a cure to her disease. This story completely rewrote the Mr. Freeze character forever. This is the version of the character that is almost always adapted to any Batman continuity that followed the animated series. It turned the character into almost an anti-hero. A villain who did bad things, but did them for a good cause. A man who didn't revel in evil, but instead sought out to save the ones he loved through, albeit nefarious means. This movie took that story and made it a brief backdrop. It's present here, it's the character's motivation, but what's severely missing is the humanity that comes with such a plight. We never see Mr. Freeze as a man, he's too busy being a cartoon. Which is ironic when we're talking about a live-action movie, yet the cartoon treated itself much more like a real event. We don't see the sorrow, the heartbreak, the pain the character feels, because his scheduled screen time's already taken up with him making shitty ice puns and hamming it up. He's all too thrilled about his awful ways. I think this one hurts the most because it feels wildly out of character. Arnold Schwarzenegger's performance completely goes against his nature. This conflicts with the character in general, but it seems to conflict even with its own lore. For example, there's a scene where Mr. Freeze chastises Batman, happily telling him, Your emotions make you weak. That's why this day's mine. <laughs> Yet he's a character that's driven entirely by emotion. My passion. Thoughts for my bride alone. The love of his wife and the heartbreak he has from losing her. This is what drives Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze, despite his cold nature, is actually a warm-hearted individual. He's driven by his own compassion and love. I mean, we're not talking about the Terminator here. You are made up of emotion. You lie! Plus, to see him so excited about being bad, it's just... It's... It's just all kind of... I'm losing words here, but it's just... It's just... It's bad. It's all like... It's bad. It's really bad. I know this is hard for you, but winter is coming. We know what's coming with it. Winter has come at last. Allow me to break the ice. The ice, man, cometh. You are not sending me to the cooler. What killed the dinosaurs? The ice age! Can you be cold, Batman? Cool party. <laughs> Always winterize your pipes. Let's kick some ice. I can understand a pun here and there, because that even happened in the animated series, but they weren't as constant, and they certainly aren't as consistently terrible. The monster who took you from me will soon learn that revenge is a dish best served cold. But in this movie, it's like the guy's going out of his way to make a joke for an audience of zero. I'm afraid that my condition has left me cold to your pleas of mercy. No! All right, everyone. Chill. 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 To me, this version of Mr. Freeze is a complete slap in the face to his whole arc. And still to this day, we've yet to see the Iceman return to the big screen. Ooh. Talk about your cold shoulder. And I sure hope that changes soon. But don't worry, he's in good company. Because there's plenty of characters this movie did an injustice to. Bane is turned into a brute. I mean, the guy has always had muscle, but now they completely neglect his brain. I can't imagine that Joel Schumacher did any research into the character outside of literally just looking at a comic book cover. Probably took one look and said, oh yeah, that, that's muscle guy, yeah, that's, that's what he is. Not only does the monster not have a high IQ, but he doesn't even have an IQ to speak of. He is now only capable of repeating one to two words per sentence. And that is it. Enough monkey business. We've got work to do. <sighs> monkey work. Guy just comes off like a jacked up Pokemon. <laughs> There's not that much to say about him. Because he really doesn't have a whole lot to say himself. So if you ever wondered what it'd be like to have a parrot on steroids, don't you worry, this movie finally answers that question. Then you have Batgirl. As opposed to having the character be Commissioner Gordon's kid, she's now Alfred's niece. I guess I could almost understand the reasoning behind it, considering how irrelevant the Commissioner is in these movies. 
He barely has a role, and when he is present, he's usually the butt of the jokes. So maybe having her be his daughter would be a mistake just for this continuity. But having her be Alfred's niece is just as questionable. First off, you have Alicia Silverstone playing the character, an actress who, you know, no offense, doesn't have the greatest range. But she's supposed to be the very British Michael Goff's niece, yet there isn't even the slightest hint at a British accent. Oh, as if. Instead of giving her an accent, replacing it is an insistence that she's British because she just came back from her school in England. So yeah, that's... That's kind of a tough sell. I don't even necessarily think Alicia did a bad job here. She just didn't do her bat job. Oh god, the puns. What has this movie done to my brain? You're about to become compost. No sign of the snowman. Maybe he melted. Using feminine wiles to get what you want? Trading on your looks? Read a book, sister. That passive-aggressive number went out long ago. She wasn't the bat girl we wanted. And she sure as hell wasn't the bat girl we needed either. For the work that she was given to do, I think that she did do a decent job. I mean, I, I think at the very least there was some chemistry between her and her would-be love interest, Chris O'Donnell. You know, that's a point in, in this movie's favor. But yeah, she's definitely not my favorite part of the movie. And yet, she's still far from my least favorite part also, so... So I guess just let's call it even. Poison Ivy is, um... Well, she is... she is something else. There are aspects to this version of the character that I actually like. Aesthetically, I think the getup's pretty good. Uma Thurman has the right sounding voice and inflection for the role. And when she's not completely hamming it up, I think she does an almost decent job. I kind of feel the same way about her as I feel about Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face. It could have been good, uh, and in some scenes it is, but for the most part, it is... Not good! Like I said, she has her moments. But the problem is, is that these moments are so far and few in between. For the most part, she's absolutely over the top. Mammals. A day of reckoning is coming. That's right. And now you corrupt my research into some maniacal scheme for world domination? I am nature's arm. Her spirit. Her will. I am Mother Nature. Forget the stars. Look here at the Earth. Our mother, our womb. She deserves your loyalty and protection. Well, I, my most unabominable snowman, have been impressed by you. In fact, I propose a pairing. The same plants and flowers that saw you crawl from the primordial soup will reclaim this planet, and there will be no one to protect you. Uma Thurman comes off more like a Power Rangers villain. She has no subtlety and she's evil in the goofiest ways imaginable. She could even give Credence a run for her money. At best, it's laughably bad. And at worst, it's cringe-inducingly awful. These characters in general seem to exist as an extension of the movie itself. Not as actual characters. That might have been confusing. Hold on, let me try again. They're all the same annoyingly hokey, passé character in different gear. Each and every one of them. Except for Alfred. Alfred? Alfred is an angel. Everyone else, though, it's like the same character, different bat nipples. What I'm trying to say is that for the most part, these characters all act the same. They don't really have their own unique identity. There aren't that many personality traits that separate these characters. They're just all bound by the movie itself. It's like Seinfeld. But, you know, terrible. Batman Forever was definitely a departure from Batman and Batman Returns. But Batman and Robin feels like a significant departure from Batman Forever. Forever changed the tone of the series, and it sort of acted as a transitional shift between the final vision of Tim Burton and the first vision of Joel Schumacher. At times, Forever felt like it was attempting to keep the darker psychological themes of the first two films, but soften it up and make it more digestible for a younger audience. It was a PG version of Burton's take on the character. Batman and Robin, on the other hand, felt like it took the PG aspect from the last movie, and that's it, nothing else. When making this movie, it was almost like going into it, they decided to highlight everything that worked in Batman Forever, and eradicate everything that didn't. Strike that. Reverse it. The heart that was present in Batman Forever, even through its worst and dumbest moments, was all but gone from here replaced by a two-hour commercial to sell some action figures. 
I mean, look at it. They, they didn't even try to hide it. I'm a lover, not a fighter. That's why every Poison Ivy action figure comes complete with him. Admittedly, it did work, yes, because I owned all of these when I was a kid. But as an adult, I'm, I'm wagging my finger and shaking my head at you. Now, at the same time, that would be weird. I don't, I don't know what, what message I'd be sending by doing that. But yeah, it was effective. Everyone who's heard about the behind the scenes knows that Joel Schumacher was told to make the movie more, and this is an actual word that was used, toyetic. It worked, because I hated this movie as a kid, and I still collected all the figures in this lineup. What I'm trying to say is that you can see why the Batman 89 comic book series separates itself from this half of the continuity. Because it sucks! But also because the idea of somehow trying to take the dark, gritty, and borderline grungy world of Tim Burton's Batman and tie it into this is unfathomable. That would be like trying to link the 1960s Adam West series to the Dark Knight. These are clearly very different interpretations of the character. This movie, which is supposed to follow the gothic revival of the hero known as the Dark Knight, has much more in common with the live-action cartoon of the Caped Crusader that came out in the 1960s. The nonsensical camp, the goofy one-liners, the jokes even a dad joke telling dad wouldn't tell, the generic villain plans that make no sense whatsoever, the Hamley overacted performances by the actors, the sound effects, the goofy gags, the strange plots, the unconventional team-ups. This wasn't 90s audiences Batman. This was their parents' Batman. Just brought into the 90s. It's really hard for me to compare Batman and Robin to Batman Forever, but trying to compare and connect it to Batman or Batman Returns is next to impossible. I can't get my head around it. I think what bums me out the most about this is that quite often this movie is the first one to get brought up when people are talking about Joel Schumacher. As if this was his magnum opus. Those familiar with Schumacher's work outside of the Batman franchise would be able to tell you that this isn't his regular quality. Like Tim Burton, Schumacher's best known for his darker-toned adventures. If you need proof, look no further than The Lost Boys. I think what's most evident in this movie is it was, for the lack of a better word, a very corporate movie. The other Batman films in this lineup felt like they had purpose outside of a paycheck. It felt like those in charge of making these movies really wanted to make these movies. They were passionate about what the final product would look like. Here. I don't feel that same passion. It feels like someone rushing to turn in their first draft and immediately calling it their final draft. When looking back at Batman and Robin, it's clear that not a lot of time or thought was put into any aspect of this movie. In the end, it was charmless, it was heartless, those making it were brainless. I would say that it's less of a movie than the other Batman films. The dialogue in the movie is awful. When it's not trying and failing to make jokes, it's succeeding as living up as a punchline. Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. His name is Bane. A laundry service that delivers. Wow. Nice catch. You break it, you buy it. I'm running on empty. I need the diamonds from my hideout. I'll help you grab your rocks. <laughs> Good night. What are you, about a 50 big and tall? No. I always go a size smaller. It makes me look slimmer. Hmm. Well, I can respect your opinion. Sadly, I'm not good at rejection. I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> well, I'm totally over, all right? Positively. Me too, definitely. Great stems, though. Buds, too. Yeah, those are nice. Uh, that's my exit cue. This is a literal excerpt from the original script. These are lines that are in the movie. Now I'm having an AI read them to you, so they may come off as a little bit robotic, but I assure you, nobody has the ability to make any of these lines sound human nonetheless. I still have high hopes for the animal plant crossbreedings. If I can only find the correct dose of venom, these plants will be able to fight back like animals. I will have given Flora a chance against the thoughtless ravages of man. Personal note. My work would proceed faster if Dr. Woodrue weren't always whisking my venom samples back to his mysterious Gilgamesh wing. Why won't he let me into his lab? What is he doing in there? There are a few thought-provoking conversations and revelations in this movie. The Flying Graysons were a team. 
We had to trust each person to do his job. That's what being partners is all about. Sometimes counting on someone else is the only way you win. Have you ever regretted your life working here? Looking after heroes? No, sir. My only regret is that I was never able to be out there with you. Death and chance stole your parents. But rather than become a victim, you have done everything in your power to control the fates. But they get immediately skimmed over, probably because of how out of place they feel here. The ridiculous, insane, over-the-top performances of Umit Thurman and John Glover is proof that nobody is safe in this movie. It doesn't matter how talented the cast was, the movie made it impossible for anyone to properly perform. Chris O'Donnell, who I thought did a pretty serviceable job in the last movie, has completely lost whatever likability he once had. One movie later, he went from a defiant, adventurous kid to a whiny man-child. And for all these effortful performances that chew up the scenery, also came an effortless performance in the form of George Clooney's Bruce Wayne. I get how on paper such a casting might be merited. George Clooney was a charming, good-looking, rich bachelor. Based on that alone, it sounds like he's tailor-made to play Bruce Wayne. But seeing it in execution might make you wish whoever casted him would be executed. Clooney gives the most bland, emotionless, uncaring performance of his career. He doesn't come off as Batman or Bruce Wayne. Hell, come to think of it, he doesn't really come off as George Clooney. He carried himself with all of the professionalism and attentiveness as modern-day Bruce Willis would have. With the girl? Who is this? Oh, my apologies. This dude straight up doesn't give a flying bat's ass about this movie. But hey, at least Arnold Schwarzenegger looks like he's having fun. But to be fair, that might just be because he's getting a shitload of cash to appear almost only exclusively in close-ups. While some no-name gets paid less than half of what he gets paid to do most of his shots. One thing that always bugged me is how this movie contradicts the entire established continuity. Even the movie that came before it. Batman and Robin portrays its titular character's relationship as being that of a big brother, little brother type of dynamic. But the movie that came before it clearly depicted it as a father and son type of ordeal, which is pretty much what they do in the comics as well. So, like everything else in this movie, that just doesn't feel right. And seeing the two compete for the love of a pretty redhead was giving me some some unintentional PTSD that I don't I don't ever want to relive. I didn't like it then, I don't like it now, I'll never like it ever. There's a few other problems I have with Batman and Robin too. Some of which I don't often hear get brought up, but that's probably because by comparison to everything else that's wrong with the movie, you know, it just seems inconsequential. There's a whole subplot devoted to Bruce Wayne potentially tying the knot, you know, settling down and becoming a married man, but this relationship and his love interest is given next to no screen time. You could easily cut it out of the movie altogether, and it doesn't change the narrative whatsoever. She doesn't do anything, she doesn't add anything to the main plot, she doesn't really have a role, except on paper. Nothing. When the movie starts, the two are already together. We have no idea about how or when they met, or how long they've been together, what their relationship is like, and by the end of it, none of that changes. We learn nothing about Julie Madison. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and say, a lot of you listening to this are probably just hearing that name for the first time, even if you've seen the movie. It is a completely forgettable and unneeded aspect to this film as a whole. We know nothing about them as a couple, and we know nothing about her in general. But why should anybody be surprised? They have Bruce break up with each of his girlfriends in between movies with a little rhyme or reason, so why not just have him start dating somebody before they hit record? It's just weird that not only is marriage a thing for some reason in this movie, but it's marriage to a character that we know nothing about. She's given far less time than Vicki Vale, Catwoman and Dr. Chase Meridian. Let me put it to you like this. Julie just barely gets more lines than Nora Freeze. And she's frozen the whole movie. She, she doesn't speak. I also take issue to the fact that this whole movie wants to focus on Batman and Robin bitching and bickering like an old couple. Because we barely did anything to establish them as a team at all. In the last movie, we end with them pairing up. And then in this movie, we start with them already having a falling out. Well, what's the point? Another thing that drives me crazy is the naming convention of these movies makes absolutely no sense. You got Batman, a movie about Batman, so fair enough. Batman Returns, where'd he go? Where'd he go? I have no idea. He was there the whole time by Gotham's own admission. I, I don't, wh where's he returning from? 
I, I mean, I guess to us, sure, Batman is returning to the movie theaters, so, you know, I'll, I'll give you a pass, but you're walking on thin ice, and that is not an intentional pun. You named the movie about Batman and Robin Batman Forever. Why? And then you named the movie about the Bat family expanding. This feeling of, of the Batman legacy continuing what you can only expect to be forever. And you name it Batman and Robin? You literally just added a third to your team, turning the dynamic duo into the terrible trio. And the movie's named Batman and Robin? What, Batgirl just gets no love? You're really giving merit to the whole women working just as hard as men and getting none of the credit argument. I mean, she literally saved the titular characters in the conclusion. I... Why is it Batman and Robin? We got Robin over here bitching about not getting a Robin signal, but poor Batgirl couldn't even get her name credited. Now here's something I need to address. The thing that's obviously on all of our minds when we watch these movies... The Bat Nipples. Are the nipples still there? Of course, it's the Joel Schumacher film. Everybody has nipples. According to director Joel Schumacher, the suits were redesigned to look like that of gladiators, of Spartans. And this was to show the masculinity of Batman and Robin. But, uh, Joel, I believe that as much as I believe that Quentin Tarantino includes feet in all of his movies because it's integral to his art. We all know why you did it. Just, just be honest. These look a little bit too fetishy for my taste. It's weird to think that there have been more accurate costumes in, um, other media, and yet these costumes are the ones that look like they were stolen straight off of a... another media? Shoot. But if I'm being real, nipples and cod pieces aside, these suits are kind of dope. Objectively speaking, come on. I mean, you just put some duct tape on those nipples and you're good to go. Especially that Nightwing costume. I have a question for you. Do you still have the Robin suit from the Batman and Robin days? I do. I would buy that. I want a suit that looks like that. Yeah, that's a little strange. Well, that's what I'm into. Also, how does gravity work in these movies? <laughs> How do you explain that? One last thing. How are you gonna have Seal make Kiss from a Rose for Batman Forever? A movie that song has zero place in? When it much better suits this movie? Kiss from a Rose? You have Poison Ivy out here making men fall in love with her through pheromones. Giving life-ending poisonous kisses and playing a pivotal role in the plot. And she's referred to as a flower the whole movie. She even almost leads to the breakup of Gotham's protectors. Yet the movie ends with both men finding or realizing the love they have in their lives. Not with each other, surprisingly, which is a letdown. I think we all can agree that that is the only logical closure point here. We got some real issues with women, you know that? The song would have been perfect for this movie. I mean, it wouldn't have made it any better, mind you, but it would have made sense. And that would at least be one thing about this movie that makes sense. Sorry, this shit keeps me up at night. Because of all that and much more, that is the day Batman died. For a very long time. But luckily for us, comic book characters never stay dead. And like the death of Superman, Batman would return. Again. Before I go and close this video out, I do first want to focus on the things I liked about this movie. And while it is a short list, you know, at least it is a list. If there's anything I can credit to this movie, anything at all, aside from successfully selling toys, it's the decision they made to increase Alfred's role. Michael Gaff is one of only two actors who had been with the series from its inception with Michael Keaton, all the way to its sad end with George Clooney. So it was nice to see him get more screen time and have a portion of the plot focus on him. The scenes with him in this movie always make me smile. There's some of the sweetest and most genuine feeling moments in all of these movies. Well, not all heroes wear masks. Mm. His performance is as great as it's ever been. And the fact that more time is devoted to him, his character, and he actually somewhat factors into the plot, makes his time with the franchise feel that much more justified. Alfred is a very bright light in the seemingly endless darkness that is Batman and Robin. He's so on point, and he never once throughout the entire series run falls prey to bad writing. 
God bless Michael Gaff. And what I also need to credit this movie with is that for as bad as it is, and believe me, it is bad. It is a terrible, god-awful attempt at filmmaking. But I've probably rewatched this one more times than any other Batman film. It's completely awful, but it's still awfully entertaining. As a kid, I didn't like this movie, but I did have fun with it. And now as an adult watching it, I love it. But definitely not for the reasons that were intended. I like Batman and Robin for the same reason I like movies like The Room. And in a weird way, I kind of think that that's an achievement in of itself. The worst thing you can ever do as a content creator is make something forgettable. Make something that nobody cares about. But no one is forgetting Batman and Robin. Not you, not me, not the ghost of Joel Schumacher. Nobody who has ever witnessed this catastrophe will ever forget its existence. And I kind of think that's a little bit beautiful. Is it a good movie? No, absolutely not. But it's so bad that, in its own special way, it's, it's kind of good. But it's good for being bad. You can turn this movie on at get-togethers and gather your friends up and still have a lot of fun watching it. Pim, can we watch something else? It's, it's, it's about to get really good. It's about to get really good. Trust me. So while the movie should be frowned at, it should also be applauded. Though maybe not at the same time. I don't, I don't know what that would look like or, or what, what message that's sending. So maybe separately. What else could I possibly say about a movie that is so bad that the director has had to come out and apologize for it on numerous occasions? If I, if I disappointed them in any way, then I really want to apologize, because it wasn't my intention. My intention was just to entertain them. With that being said, if you liked the video, then like this video. And if you want to see a follow-up to this Batman retrospective with another retrospective on the next line of Batman films, then let me know in the comments section by leaving a comment that says Robin was a real dick. Grayson, feel free to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, where I post about upcoming videos and other projects. Links in the description below. With that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, Vinfuso, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. Not all heroes wear masks. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one... Bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel. Bonida. 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 Bonded there used to be a grain tower alone on the sea you became the light on the dark side of me love remained a drug that's the high end not the pill but did you know that when it snows my eyes become large and the light that you shine can be seen? Baby, I compare you to a kiss from a rose on the gray ood, the more I get of you, the stranger it feels, yeah and now that your rose is in bloom a light hits the gloom on the gray bonida, bonida da da da. Bonded there is so much a man can tell you, so much he can say you remain my power, my pleasure, my pain, baby to me you're like a growing addiction that I can't deny won't you tell me, is that healthy, baby? But did you know that when it snows my eyes become large and the light that you shine can be seen? Baby, I compare you to a kiss from a rose on the gray ood, the more I get of you, the stranger it feels. Yeah, now that your rose is in bloom, a light hits the gloom on the gray. I've been kissed by a rose on the gray. I've been kissed by a rose on the gray. I've been kissed by a rose on the gray. And if I should fall.